There is peace and contentment in my father's house today. Lots of food on his table and no one is turned away. There is singing and laughter as the hours pass by, but a hush calms the singing as the father sadly cries. My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Push away from the table, look out through the window pane. Just beyond the house of plenty lies a field of golden grain, and it's white unto harvest. But the reapers, where are they in the house? Oh, can't the children hear the father sadly say, My house is full, but my field is empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems my children all want to stay around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. No one wants to work in my field. Turn your Bibles tonight to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians tonight, chapter number five, and then it should just be a few pages over, Colossians chapter three. Um, you know, I learned this a while ago, I didn't realize it. God gave us two specific prayer requests in the Bible. One of them is pray for the peace of Israel. That is somewhere in Psalms, peace of Jerusalem. God asked us to pray for that. And then in the Gospels, Jesus asked us to pray for him to send more laborers into his harvest. And that's exactly what Miss Bernice was singing about. We all need to go, make sure we're being used by God, letting God use us. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I don't know if any of y'all remember or not, but there was a missionary here named Brother Briggs. I found his prayer card back in Michael's office. Um, but he just preached on working in the garden and how that wasn't hard. Working in God's garden was rewarding. I'm not going to lie. I felt like maybe I should preach or something when I was then, like called to preach. And I was like, that sounds terrible, never going to happen. But honestly, just going into the harvest, doing what God wants us to. Um, such a blessing. Honestly, it's enjoyable. So if God's working on you to do something, go into the harvest, um, just make sure you do it. It's totally worth it. But book of Ephesians tonight. That is not my message, but God told us to go. So Ephesians chapter 5 tonight. Um, familiar passage, talking about being filled with the Spirit. And if we want to have a true revival next week, we all need to make sure that each of us individually are living in the Spirit. Paul told the Ephesian church in be not, verse 18, chapter 5, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one unto another in the fear of God, and if you got your finger in Colossians chapter 3, um, it's Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Similar passage. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father um, by him. Let's pray. 
God, as we come in your presence tonight, Lord, um, just thank you so much for the service so far, just the music, the prayer request, um, just so we can come to you as a church, just worship you, grow together. But I pray tonight we need to be filled with your spirit. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. Just um, use me, help um, us just to have spirit-filled listening in the, um, the congregation, Lord. I pray you just use me, help us all grow in you, Lord. Praise praise now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as we're living in the world, we all know Satan tries to throw distractions and temptations our way. He will try to make us lose focus and quit serving our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows our weaknesses, and he's very strong and good at getting us to fall while serving our God. But God loves to help his children. In fact, he loves it so much that he sent his son to die for us. Forty days, or He rose from the grave three days later and then ascended to heaven. And after that, God sent down his Holy Spirit so he wouldn't be alone. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity of God, and he moves into the heart of the believer at the point of salvation. He guides and directs us through temptations and teaches us how to live the Christian life, and he calms us in the hard times. And then if you look at verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the capital S Spirit. Whenever you see a capital S um, on Spirit in the Bible, it is the Holy Spirit. That's how you know which Spirit is talking about. Um, so the, that means we must have the Holy Spirit fill us inside. When we get saved, he moves into our hearts. But we need to be filled with the Spirit. It says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. So obviously, we know we're not supposed to be drunk. Um, that's a sin. But it's also just a sin just to even drink alcohol. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So we as Christians are to avoid alcohol because we know it's wrong. And if we drink it, the Bible says we're unwise. Um, we should not allow ourselves to be controlled by the influence of alcohol, and we should have nothing to do with it. But it's in a good illustration of how we should be with the Spirit. Being controlled by alcohol is a sin, but it's a good image of how we should allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Um, we should allow the Holy Spirit to control our every move and decision in this life. You know, I was joking around with Janae before church. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. I said, I asked if she wanted to preach. She said no, but maybe we should get up and start holy rolling and stuff. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, um, when you see it full of you, it's not slaying the Spirit, dancing around, speaking in tongues. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So if you want to see the Holy Spirit in your life, um, you just need to grow in Him more, read the Bible. And this love, joy, peace, long-suffering, each of these will grow in your life, and that's how people will know that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Jesus told Nicodemus that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. Obviously, you can't see the wind, but it says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, John 3, 8. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So we can tell when someone is born again by their fruit. You know, when I'm sitting in my office back there, if I'm wondering if it's raining or windy or whatever, I can look and I can see the branches moving back and forth, all the leaves moving. And I can't see the wind, but I know it's there because I can hear it, I can see it in the trees. And that's how the Holy Spirit is in our lives. You can't see it, but you can tell by the fruit of someone's life how they behave, how they behave, if the Holy Spirit is in them. So we should let the Spirit guide each decision and act upon each decision in our lives in faith. As a drunk man does not, know, does not do what he normally would, we, when we're filled with the Spirit, are to step out in faith and trust God, even if we can't see a clear outcome, um, if we think we can't do it, God can. So we need to be filled with the Spirit and trust Him. So Paul says to be filled with the Spirit. And then he gives us basic instructions how to be filled with the Spirit. Sing and teach through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Thank God always and submit ourselves one to another. When we do these, we can then live so that we will be controlled by the Spirit. And others will be able to see the Holy Spirit of God working to make us more like Christ every day. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 starts off, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So the first step to being filled with the Spirit is just to get to know God's word. It says to have God's word richly dwelling in us. Richly means plenteously and abundantly. The teachings of the Bible are to be in our hearts abundantly. They're to be overflowing. And this is why we memorize verses, we sing scripture songs, we study our Bible. And God's Word tells us in many places that we are responsible to truly get to know God's Word. 
I have a professor at college, and he always tells us, you know, back in the Bible times, people may have made mistakes, but they didn't have the full word of God. God gave us the full revelation, all he needs us to know, and it's our responsibility to know it, and we're more accountable than they are because he gave us his word. We need to know it. So, first of all, we need to see, we need to just read God's word. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13, Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. We should set aside time every day to be sure that we read God's word. This will help our days go by better. And I found it helpful if I read it in the morning. You know, normally when I get up, I take a shower, stuff, get ready, come over here. And when I'm in my office, I start off by reading my Bible and praying. Well, today I actually read it before, the Bible before I even got out of bed. I'm not suggesting that. I normally fall asleep. Today was a rare occasion. I did not fall asleep when I read it. But um, honestly, just reading it before I even got out of bed, um, I'm sure you can ask my mom. She probably noticed I was not as grumpy as I normally am when I wake up. So just spending time in God's Word helps the day to go by better. We need to read it, but we also need to study it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So to be approved unto God, we need to study His Word. In it, we see the instructions for how to live right. We just need to find it. We need to, Jesus told His disciples, or He told the Jews, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5.39. So we need to search the Bible, search the scriptures for any questions we have of how to live. Just be in our Bibles to know how to live, and that's how we, God will approve our lifestyle because we're living for him. We need to read it, study it, and then just memorize it. Psalm 119, the largest chapter in the Bible, I think there's 176 verses. I don't remember only two or three verses don't mention the law of God, the Bible of God. Just the word of God is mentioned all throughout there. Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And later verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. We need to read and study and memorize God's word, so we can hide it in our heart, and God will show us how to avoid temptation. He'll give us the right... Um, He'll lead us in the right direction so we can follow him. You know, um, we hear the illustration a lot. You know, you turn on a flashlight today in the dark, you can see half a mile, whatever. You can see forever in front of you. But in the Bible times, the lamp was just so you could take one step at a time. And that's how faith is. God's word will show us just the next step in our lives. If we would see or the whole plan for our lives, honestly, if when God was working on my heart to just start playing guitar over there, and he just said, hey, I want you to start playing guitar now, so you can preach later. I'd been like, yeah, I think I'm okay. Let's not, let's not do that. No. But step by step, he was working on me, um, got me more comfortable. And God will eat, just, by following his word, he'll guide us each step into doing things that we never thought we could do. So we need to read God's word, study God's word, and memorize God's word. And then just meditate on it. Think about it. Blessed is the man, Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever we, he doeth shall prosper. So we will be blessed when we delight in God's word, and when we meditate on it, when we think about it, just all throughout the day, just constantly throwing it around in our mind, making sure we're doing more for God, learning more about Him, just doing what He wants us to do, following Him. And when we know God's Word, it helps us to get through hard times. Um, whenever I'm having a hard time, um, just start quoting Scripture in my mind. Honestly, most of the time when I wake up in the morning, I just start quoting it in my mind. Um, I normally you know, lose focus 20 times, but the more I think about the Scripture, the better my mood gets in the morning. Um, if you learn anything from this message, it's I'm not a morning person. I feel like I've said that five times. <laughs> it's not trying to, but God's word will help us overcome our hard times. And lastly, we need to read it, study it, memorize it, think about it, and just live God's word. This book of the law, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That's the only verse where God ever mentions success. So if you want to have a successful life, be prosperous. You need to not only think about it, talk about God's word, but observe to do according to all that is written therein. Each verse in the Bible applies to us. Um, some of the Old Testament, um, it applies to us, but in a different way. We can learn from it. 
but living God's word is what will help us have good success in life. We'll be able to live the Christian life as we should. And then Paul gives us an easy, practical way to hide God's word in our heart, to remember it, and that's through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If you look at Colossians 3.16, again, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So we just talked about that. Make sure we have God's word in our life constantly. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We see that we are to use songs to teach the word of Christ. And so the songs we allow in our lives can have a great impact on our lives. And Paul says to listen to and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Um, a psalm is a sacred psalm or hymn, a song composed on a device, divine subject and in praise of God. So psalms are basically from the scripture, verses that we sing when we do scripture songs. Um, in the hymnal, I know who, I'm have, who I have believed in. Um, it's one of Paul's writings. I remember the verse, um, Matthew 6, 33, um, seek ye first. These are all verses from the Bible that we sing so we can remember the principles easier. Um, Monday nights at college. The guys and the girls will go over to the student center, and the dean of the students, Brother Decker, will give us a devotion each Monday night. But we start off by just singing scripture songs, and that helps because then we learn more verses. It gets stuck in our head all throughout the week, and that's how we learn. Honestly, that's probably how I learned most songs. Um, my mom taught me that from a kid. Just singing scriptures will help you. You can get attuned to a verse. It'll help you memorize it. So we need to sing psalms and then hymns. A hymn is a song or an ode in honor of God. This is a song about God or something he has done for us. So we think of the songs that we sing, the songs that are in this hymnal that we um, got back out again. God gives us blessed assurance. You know, it says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. You know, once we're saved, we can't lose Jesus. We will always have that assurance. In our hardest times, we can trust him because he's our shelter in the time of storm. Um, when we're scared, he'll hold us tight, keep us safe till the storm passes by. Each of these songs, if you just flip through the hymnal, you can learn so much. Um, or like when you grow up in church, for like me, you'll learn a song, have it stuck in your head all the time, and then someone will preach about it, preach about a verse, and you'll be like, oh, that's from the Bible. It's an easy way to learn biblical principles. You know, old rugged cross, Christ arose, he lives. These teach us about the gospel. He died on the cross, but yet he rose again and he lives. Amen. And just on, only trust him and Jesus saves. We believe the gospel we will be on our way to heaven, and we're saved by the blood of the crucified one. So just scrolling through the pages of our hymnal, there's some beautiful songs, beautiful lyrics. Um, I took a music theory class in high school, and honestly, we would just study hymns half the time, because just it's good music to it. But the most important part is the words will teach us doctrine. Psalms, hymn, and spiritual songs. Um, Albert Barnes' commentary says that spiritual songs are odes or songs relating to spiritual things in contradistinction from those which were sung in places of festivity and revelry. Anything spiritual is the opposite of carnal, the opposite of fleshly. So these are songs that don't appeal to our flesh. They just make us think about God, cause us to think about the things of God, and, want to, and make us want to serve God. Um, I think of some like Sweet Beulah Land, This World Is Not My Home, that remind us of our heavenly home, I'd rather have Jesus, you know, that song just reminds us to keep our priorities straight. No matter what we get in this world, Jesus is the most important. And then one of my favorites, um, I sang it at Mass and I realized how much I liked it, was For What Earthly Reason. Just reminds us that literally Jesus left heaven, left his throne, just to come save each of us, to save me individually, to save you. And we are the whole reason he came to earth. And we see that Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, music was meant to glorify God, and it can greatly help us in our Christian lives, but the wrong music can hurt us. Um, when you read in the Bible, when Exodus, I believe, when Moses went up on the mountain to talk to God, he came down because God said the children of Israel had made the golden calf, and they were worshiping the calf, and when he came down, about halfway down the hill, whatever, Joshua was there, and he says, it sounds like a war. Their music sounded like war. It did not sound glorifying to God. So the wrong music is linked is connected to the wrong worship but also what well, Paul sa says in 1st Thessalonians to abstain from all appearance of evil if it sounds wrong it probably is wrong just um, something I always feel bad about I think about my CD player doesn't work in my car so I bought one of the things you plug into the cigarette thing the lighter I don't know what it is the power the power thing in the car and um, 
so it hooks to the radio, but it always sounds bad because when I first turn on my car, that doesn't turn on first, the radio station it links to does, and it is the rap station. So whenever I turn on my phone, it's like three seconds of rap, which sounds really bad. So just things like that we got to be careful of, watch, make sure we don't give the wrong image, uh, appear to be evil. And then he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Just to clarify, I do not listen to rap. That probably sounded really bad. It probably sounded terrible. No, I just that <laughs> I don't listen to rap. Okay, just trust me on that one. Music that sounds like sin is not glorifying to God. But when we listen to music that doesn't sound like the world's music and has words that teach us biblical doctrine, God can use it. God commanded Moses. He told him to teach the children of Israel a song so they would remember to serve him. Deuteronomy 31, 19 says, so the book of Deuteronomy basically is the generation that came out of Egypt had all died. So this is the next generation, the younger generation, going in, and Moses, right before he dies, is retelling all the law so they know what to do when they get into Canaan into the promised land. But part of the way God had Moses teach them his law, he said, now therefore write ye this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. So God told them, hey, teach them this song. It's uh, De Deuteronomy 31, 32 through there. Um, if you want to read it, it's a really long song, but it's how the children of Israel remembered to keep serving God, that they made a covenant with God, and if they backed out of it, they would pay for it. So teaching songs can help us remember to serve God, to keep our commitments to him. And we need to remember that we as Christians are representing our Heavenly Father through the music we sing, play, and listen to. So let's be sure that we have psalms, hymns, and spiritual lives, or... <laughs> psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs so that we will be full of the Spirit and that others will see God in our lives. Um, we may not ever completely agree on music, but just be sure that you talk to God about it, back it up by His Word. Um, so we see we need to teach ourselves the Bible through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then Colossians 3.17 says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians 520 says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I looked it up. My Uncle Tim got me a little Bible software for graduation. And the word thank across the Bible, thank, thanksgiving, words along the same line, are all used 108 times across the Bible. And in 105, I'm sorry, in 100 of these verses, it is used regarding giving thanks to our God. So 100 of the 108 verses in the Bible talking about thanking is directly about our thanks to God. So we need to be sure that when we're praying to God, we spend time thanking Him. Something I've been learning recently is just how much prayer is simply just praising and thanking God is the biggest bulk of it, confessing our sins. And when we pray for others, you know, when we're praying for Logan, when we're praying for each of our family members and stuff like this, just pray for God's will. We don't know what's best. God does. So just pray for God's will and then thank him just nonstop. Um, Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. That's part of the model prayer. Jesus said when we pray, make sure we're praying for God's will. And then just some more verses about thanking God. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. By, um, Hebrews 13.15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, so what comes out of our mouth, giving thanks to his name. And then we see in heaven, in Revelation 4, 9, the four beasts in heaven's throne room continually give, continually give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. Amen. So the beasts in heaven, what we'll be doing when we're in heaven is just praising God, thanking him. Um, I like the song. Most of us have probably heard it. Um, it just says, for making the sun to shine, putting the stars in the sky, for the flowers that bloom, the ocean so blue, thank you, Lord. For the sparrow that sings and makes sweet melody, for the rivers that flow, the rain and the snow, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. For everything you've done for me, thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. For making me whole and saving my soul, thank you, Lord. Amen. For my home and family, for life's joys you've given me. For shoes on my feet and plenty to eat, thank you, Lord. 
for the church where I worship and pray, for the freedom that I have today. Sweet Spirit, I feel your presence so real. Thank you, Lord. Then there's a chorus, for, and then it says, for being a friend so dear, giving my sad heart cheer, for holding my hand when I cannot stand. Thank you, Lord. For giving your life for me on the cross of Calvary, Amen. for taking my place with mercy and grace. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. You know, so many simple things in there, so many things we take for granted. I mean, we just came out of July 4th, so we're all pretty, we're all thinking about our freedom, but we should be thinking about it all year round. You know, we literally get to come here freely and worship at college. Some of the guys that teach there used to pastor in Canada, and they said they have friends and stuff that literally can only have like 10 people at church at a time. So they're doing like 15, 20 services a week just so they can have church with all of their church. Um, so just don't take that for freedom. Just all the things God give us, gives us, thank God for them. And whenever we're having a down day and Satan's trying to tempt us with negative thoughts, just stop and praise God. Just count your blessings and just realize all the things God has given us. And you know, just a basic principle about um, just what God gives us. He always gives us more than we give him. Luke 6.38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So whatever we give out, whatever we give to somebody, God will give us back more. And then we can just thank him for that, thank him for taking care of us. And the last step to being full of the Spirit is Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So chapter 5 and chapter 6, um, finish out after that, talking about submission, you know, the wife submitting to the husband, children to their parents, and servants to their masters. But then it talks about husbands taking care of their wives, loving them as their own body, fathers not provoking the children to wrath, but bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and masters remembering that they have a master in heaven. Amen. So when we are full of the Spirit, when we're walking in God's will and His Spirit, we'll be obeying those in charge of us. We're not to just rebel and bring chaos and everything just because we don't like it. But we're to respect those that are in charge of us. And this will help us have a good testimony toward them. Um, just let them see how good our God truly is. And if you're in charge of something, like a boss or whatever, just respect those under you. Treat them well. You know, Jesus is our model. He, sur he was God. He was God in the flesh. He was God's son. He was omnipotent. He could do anything. He was omniscient. He knew everything. And he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But he surrendered to his father's authority. And he led his disciples in love. Even though he could do anything, um, he still went to the cross for us. You know, before he went to the cross, he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He said, look, I don't want my will to be done. I want your will to be done, God. And then the verse I've been trying to memorize lately is Galatians 2.20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So each day when we live, we're crucified with Christ. We need to die to ourselves. And since we're living, we need to let Christ live through us. And being full of the Spirit is all about that. It's pointing the attention, the glory to God, to Jesus Christ. So whenever we are not submissive to others, um, we are leaving a bad testimony. Obviously, if it goes against the Bible, we are to respect the Bible, go with what the Bible says above the authority, but we are to submit authority to authority in the fear of God. We are doing it, we are obeying because we fear God, because we respect God, not because of whoever the leader is. And then Colossians 3 tells us this twice. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That's Colossians 3.17, and then 3.23 and 24 says... And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord. So whatever we do, we need to do it because we serve God, because we love God, to keep a good testimony for our Lord. I believe it's first Samuel twelve, right through there. David had sinned with Bathsheba. And then he's the king, so obviously he gets a lot of attention. So when Nathan the prophet came in and told him, he said, look, I don't remember the exact wording, but he said, look, David, 
He's like, you just messed up. You messed up, but it made our God look bad. So we need to submit to authority, obey, leave a good testimony to leave a good testimony for our God. So ultimately, the main reason to live a spirit-filled life is to glorify God. God commands us as Christians to live this life, and we are to strive to live in the spirit daily. Um, without the spirit, all of what we do as a church, as a church family, or just on our own without the spirit is a waste. But when we're filled with the spirit, then the smallest things we do can become wonderful. God gets, a, God gets the glory when we teach ourselves to obey his word, to learn his word, um, listen to the right music about his word, praise him, thank him, and obey those in authority over us. That's for the saved. And if you're lost in the spirit speaking to you tonight, you need to realize God is not your savior, but he can be. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sin. It says, Romans tells us in 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even though we've sinned, we deserve death and hell, God saved us. Or God um, sent his son to die for us, gave us a gift so we can be saved. And if we believe in his gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection, it's the only way to heaven and ask him to forgive us of our sins, we can be saved today. Um, they told the Philippian jailer, Paul and Silas did, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So if by chance someone here isn't saved tonight and God's working on your heart, you can be unbound from sin. You can get off of the way to hell onto the way to heaven and you too can have the Holy Spirit in your life. He'll be your eternal friend to guide you through this life, and everything you do can be blessed when done in the Holy Spirit. Christians, that goes for us too. No matter how small of a thing we do, the Bible says if we give a cool drink of water to a kid, if we do it for God's glory, it's blessed. So next week when we come to church, it may seem like a small thing if we come Monday and Tuesday. But just remember the song says, Little is much when God is in. Now close with this. In the harvest field now ripened, there's a work for all to do, each of us. Hark the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Amen. In the mad rush of the Broadway, in the hurry and the strife, tell of Jesus' love and mercy. Give to them the word of life. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown in heaven and we can win it if we'll go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle in the sacred place of prayer. Just remember, even prayer is just amazing. Even if you can't do anything else, just pray. But then the last verse is, when the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. So just remember this week to do all we can to be in God's word, to pray, thank him, sing the right songs, and just have a good testimony in the world. And if we do that, we can see revival next week. We can see God use us. We can see revival before next week if we'll just follow God. So heads bowed, eyes closed. Is the piano player's coming?
Hey boy, I wish I could. Then we got some big thing we'd like to be able to do. But it's the little things that mean so much in life. Uh, <clears throat> just right now, as the invitation was given, people leaving the altar. Uh, my head was bowed, but all of a sudden I seen four feet in one place. I looked up and I saw two ladies, each of them down the other from the other. You go up there. But I'm trying to take the place. You know, we ought to be yield, willing to yield and want to the Lord at all times. Thank you, Michael. Please, please, be here Sunday. Come praying, inviting others to be with you, praying the Holy Spirit would speak to me. I believe it was the only many years ago said if you don't have revival, say, and draw a circle and then get in the middle of it and say, Lord, start the revival in this circle. That's what we need to do. We love it. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, please, no one for a moment. This week, coming, if you would help us pray, we can have at least 20 of us who would be willing to this to take and give at least $100 if we could. If you can't do that, then that's fine. A dollar may be as much as someone else. But let's be faithful. We can do this. We can have a meeting. We don't have to be mentioned in money or anything else. Just pray that you help us Lord, um, this help me to, to give, and I can guarantee you the Lord will bless you, and I will make you this promise, and that is if you give, and God doesn't bless you, you let me know, and I'll give it back to you personally. Heads are bowed, and I will close. For the Kyle, dismiss us in the prayer. You're going to follow us to this day. Thank you for this message.